Welcome to the Daily Update, where I'll go over the action in the market from Monday, April 29th, and then we'll see how things look for Tuesday, April 30th. It was a pretty slow day. There were no economic reports that came out. We had the Fed meeting that will conclude on Wednesday, and then they'll make their announcement. They'll release their little report. They'll have their press conference, and it could be kind of wild. We don't really know if it's going to be wild to the upside or wild to the downside. There's also some major economic reports being released this week. We have ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing, and we have the employment situation report. So some big things are happening. So it's not really surprising that Monday was a little bit quieter. Now, we could be turning back more positive. We're not quite there yet, and we have overhead resistance above where we're at right now. But the market's holding up. But this could change at any time. It could break to the upside. There's also justification for it to break to the downside. When we look at the weekly chart, that 5110 to 5111 level, we're a little bit above that right now, but we're still battling with the 50 day moving averages. So the weekly chart won't really count until the end of the week. So we have to kind of focus on the daily things for right now. But we are looking a little better and showing some improvement. So let's go back and talk about what happened, and then I'll go through the charts. Right at the open, we had a higher open. There wasn't much of a gap, but the futures were fairly positive. That led to the higher open, and we kind of hit the high near the beginning of the session. We hit resistance at R1 at 51.19. That's above that 51.10 to 51.11 level. As the day went on, we just chopped sideways, and then there was – a treasury announcement made that they're going to need to borrow more money than what was planned, which big surprise there, that led to a bit of a decline, but it quickly bounced up from that. But prices dropped down to the unchanged level and to the daily pivot at 5,096. We quickly rebounded back up to close slightly below R1. We were up 0.32%. On below average volume, which again is not really a surprise. We are looking a little better with the short and intermediate and the long term is still holding up. But some of our indicators, because it was a positive day, we have some of our indicators that click over based on a positive close and actually show a little bit of an improvement. This week is all about inflation, interest rates. What's the Fed going to say? What are they going to do? Possibly nothing. It's more what they're going to say. What are these reports going to tell us? And then at the end of the week, what's the employment situation going to look like? And we want to keep an eye on the geopolitical events, which really are not having an impact right now. There's still a lot of protests and things going on, but that really doesn't affect the stock market. Some comments. There was a decline, and then we saw a rebound. After the Treasury did come out and say they're going to have to borrow more than oopsie daisy that when we thought we were going to have to borrow, we're still battling with the 50 day moving average, especially the simple moving average. And that's what most folks really focus on. So we want to be able to get above that and then close above it. We're actually already extreme positive with the Stoke RSI, really touchy short term indicator. The fact that we were up on Monday kicked that into extreme positive territory. And we're still looking extreme negative with the slope oscillator, but it's turning up and it's crossing above its moving average. So it is showing some improvement. This is our touchiest oscillator. So if it starts to look better and continue to go up, it'll that'll flow through to the other oscillators, which are also showing just a little bit of an improvement right now. But in the long term, and again, you could take this as negative, meaning that we're extreme positive with our 150 and 200 period simple moving averages and say, okay, that's good momentum. But at the same time, we're extreme positive there as well. The current scenario, it's likely to change this week. I did modify it a little bit at the end of last week where the Fed might be done raising rates and that rate cuts in 2024 are now in doubt. Hopefully there'll be some light shed on that whole idea or whole concept this week, and we'll have a little bit more to work with concerning that. The dollar did decline. There was The Japanese yen really bounced up. It's now down against the dollar, but it was really bouncing up. And there might have been some kind of intervention in Japan to 
prop up the currency, but it really didn't affect the U.S. dollar index all that much. However, it did go down, but it wasn't down all that much. Interest rates were also lower. We closed at 4.61% with the 10-year yield, or after Friday, we were at 4.67%. We're still inverted with the yield curves. We ticked up just a little bit with sentiment. We're still negative, but we had been at 42. Now we're at 43. This is where we're seeing a little bit of a change as well. We're still negative with the ADX. Our trend is still negative, but the ADX is now weakening. It's dropping below its moving average. And that might be more the shift that we're seeing potentially to more of a positive climate, but we're still above 20. So we're still in a trending environment with the up day. Our bias is positive and I'm still keeping our momentum at mixed for right now. I know we've had a good little bounce in here and we could turn it over to positive, but there's so many variables that are going to be coming out throughout this week that we still want to pretty much be on guard with those things. We didn't have any economic reports in Monday's session, so there's no charts to show you. Here's some charts that I found at Isabel Net. Anything but bonds, bull, long monopoly, short leverage. This is just going back, really what we're talking about here is what were the big companies at that time? And I'm not going to read off this whole list, but you'll notice that there's a few carryovers. There was a period of time. You look right now, Apple, you know, one of the most darling companies. of. All, there was a time you could get Apple for $7 a share. And it was considered kind of the redheaded stepchild of the computers. It's before the iPod, before the iPhone, before the iPad, before they really changed a lot of things. And they were just, they were kind of like AMD to Intel. Well, now AMD is starting to surpass Intel, where Apple has become one of the more favored stocks when you compare it to Microsoft. And there's a few that have kind of come over. I remember back in 2000, Amazon hadn't even made a profit yet. Now they're one of the bigger companies. So it just gives you an idea of where we're at. And then what is the percentage of the market cap? And this is where the real wealth of the stock market is at right now when you look at the bigger companies. This is looking at the inflow, and these are mortgage-backed securities. The reason I bring this up is this was a real catalyst for the great financial crisis back in 2006, well, 7, and then it kind of finally fell apart in 2008. And if you watch the movie uh, The Big Short, that was part of what had to do with the great financial crisis. There's another movie that Kevin Spacey was in. I don't remember margin calls I, I i forget the name of that movie but that was actually put out before the great financial crisis and kind of foretold what was going to happen very interesting movie you might have mixed feelings if not negative feelings about kevin spacey but nonetheless all right anyway here with the mortgage-backed securities we're seeing a lot of money going into this right now now it's not necessarily good nor bad <clears throat> it's just a lot of people are finding their way into these things and if they fall apart, they're going to have to pull this money out pretty quickly. And we, we just want to be aware of what's going on with this. Then annual interest payments at $1 trillion and rising. And thank you, modern monetary theory. Yes. Then some charts that I found on Twitter. This is interesting. And this, I, I've been doing this for decades. But now the there's more, this chart kind of backs up what I've been doing. I always try to enter positional or directional positions as close to the close as possible. I want that's when the smart money really comes in and decides what we're going to do as far as closing things for that day. I don't buy at the open. I just watch things as the market unfolds and then I actually get into a position near the end of the session as close to the close as I can. And according to this chart, that's what most people are doing. Now, to get out of a position, it's when my profit target is hit. That's, And that could be at the open during the day, what have you. But my focus is on entering a position. If you enter it right, and I, I don't want this to be a plain vanilla statement, but it's true most of the time that I found, if you enter something right, it's like the trade takes care of itself. After that, entrance is the most important part, in my opinion, and what I've found over the years. But this is just showing that 
the all of the volume that we see and then the last 10 minutes is a percent of volume that's the black area and that's why we see this big spike now it's always spikes up because you have these day traders and things that there's a market on close type of order that you can enter but it's really starting to pick up in this so that's another reason why i tend to wait closer to the end of the close all right recession worries are easing um, we're not really hearing much about that. In a lot of the news articles, apparently someone used AI to go through and search a bunch of articles. The name, the the times that recession has been mentioned is really starting to go down. Now you're starting to see stagflation picking up just a little bit. We'll have to see if that turns into anything. And then I found this other interesting chart. This is just to show what do countries outside of the U.S., how many of them actually own treasury securities but now this is as of january so it's liable to change but the japan is in first place i mean we always talk about china owning so much of our debt and they do they're in third place but japan owns an awful lot of that as well that's why we keep a close eye on what happens in japan and with their interest rates and things like that because if they start having some real problems there they might have to start dumping their treasury bonds and when you sell treasury bonds, that pushes the price down and that pushes interest rates up and that could come over into the U.S. market. So we're, that's why on the list of geopolitical events and things to watch, that's why I have Japan listed there, just to keep an eye on that. Then this is when a company comes out with their earnings and when they miss, they do pretty well. They're up a little bit under 2% when you, you look at how they perform after their earnings report comes out. But if they miss on both, that's like a double whammy negative. They miss not only on their earnings, but their forecast as well. They get hit pretty hard. We're going down about 4% or so when they miss. And this is another reason why some companies will lowball their earnings estimates so that when their report comes out, it looks better and there's more of a chance of at least it going up. But as we saw last week, the exact opposite can happen. Tesla had a bad report. It's been shooting higher. Uh, what was the other company? Was it Meta? Meta, that's it. I can't ever get used to calling that Meta. To me, it's always Facebook. <clears throat> they came out with a really good report and been getting hammered. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then this is one of the reasons why I don't use patterns. I'm not into the triangles. I'm not into the bears wedges and the flags and the pennants and the blah, blah, blah. I do kind of take notice of a head and shoulders top or a head and shoulders bottom. It just depends on if you're more of a positive person, you would focus on the top chart. If you're more of a negative person, you're going to focus on the bottom chart. These are the, are the exact same chart. It's the S&P. And this would be a head and shoulders bottom where we could go higher. This would be more like a head and shoulders top where we could end up going lower. And that's why I, I don't really focus on this. There's too much subjectivity. Now, some of you, if you do that, great, awesome, wonderful, stick with it. It's just something that I've never really implemented all that much over the years, just because two people can look at this chart and come to two different conclusions. I want it to be more objective. And we're wondering where we're at with the cycles. We're coming down here into the end of April, which we have a very negative seasonality for the last trading day of April. And I'm not quite sure where we are in here. And he hasn't updated this chart lately. I don't know if I'm going to keep using this or not. It's just something that I've been testing out here. Let's looking looking at our intraday chart where we did have a higher open. We set the high right at the open. We got above R1 and then we chopped sideways. And then this is when things kind of dropped a little bit. We came down to the daily pivot, but then quickly bounced up off of that. We saw some buying going into the close and ended up closing just a little bit below R1. Intraday, not an awful lot of changes going on. We did spike up a little bit. This is Friday's close right here when we closed for the weekend. And then this is when things opened for the pre-market session. And we did see a bit of a spike up there. So the futures held up over the weekend. And then we are still seeing where growth is improving over value. The blue line here is still above the red line. Wasn't a really strong day for growth, but it's still been outperforming value on an intraday basis. 
we came down just a little bit with our growth to value ratio with the S&P, but we have been seeing some improvement here. We want to see this continue to go up if growth is going to get back into favor. Our end of day charts, growth was up, but up about half as much as value for the large caps. It was up a little bit more for the mid caps and down less for the small caps. So we ticked down just a little bit with our end of day chart, looking at the small cap growth to value ratio, ticked down with the mid caps and ticked over just a little bit with the growth to value ratio for the S&P. We're holding up here when we look at the growth to value between these two ETFs, where we had come down to the 250 day moving average and we're still bouncing up off of that. We're wondering if this is some kind of a low that's being set here and we might see some more support if we're turning back more positive. If we roll over and break below the rainbow, then we're going to turn more negative. We saw a bit of an improvement here with discretionary to staples with the ratio on the bottom chart that's bouncing up off of its 200-day moving average. And we're still battling the 50-period moving average here with large cap growth. We have not been able to break above that, at least yet. The Wilshire also just a little bit under its 50-day moving average. Our trend, we're dropping below the moving average. The red line's on top, so we would still default to negative, but it is declining. This is showing a weakening trend. We need to see the green line come back and cross above the red line and then see the whole ADX turn and go up for that to turn more into a positive trend. So we would still default to negative here. And we're seeing that in the short term where we're going down a little bit stronger, but we're still negative with this chart as well. Volume dropped off, not really a surprise with what's coming up this week. This was now put out last week. We're coming back down more to neutral with this sentiment gauge. We're dropping down. Now we're more over here when we look at our things, but this is still slanting to the positive side, but we're coming off of that extreme positive reading. And this is more of a composite where they take the AAII the investor's intelligence, the bullish percent index, the put call ratio, the active asset managers and the VIX, and they cram it all together into this indicator. And this is the reading from insider transactions over the last week. We're getting more bullish as we're seeing this coming down. And this is a new chart. I don't know if it's going to be helpful or not. This is actually an insider buying ETF. And some folks, this is a big deal to them. They really pay attention to what insiders are doing in the companies. And this is in an uptrend. It had fallen back. It's still underneath its 50-day moving average. But I'll probably include this chart once a week or so. I may send it over to the intermarket analysis video or something. We'll just have to see if we end up finding anything useful from this. And then looking at the bullish and bearish, what they did is they took the AAII and the investor's intelligence and put it together. And we've seen a real drop down in sentiment as the market had been under pressure. Looking at the ultra index, ticked down just a little bit, but we're still getting a higher reading than any other reading we've had in 2024. We're coming down with the VIX and dropping below the moving averages with the line chart. And we're also dropping below on the bar chart. With the update, we saw the volatility of the VIX continue to decline. The momentum of the VIX is also still declining. We actually ticked up a little bit with the equity put call ratio. They finally updated after I did the video for Monday. And this was a decline in Friday's session. Not a real surprise because we had a pretty solid update. But we had an update on Monday. And to see this go up, this could be some pre-craziness hedging going on here. However, we're still declining with our five period. But if we start to turn back up, that would be more negative for the market. Right now, it's still hanging in there positive. We're also seeing the volatility risk premium coming down to the lower end of this band as volatility has really been dropping. We declined with this fear gauge and we were pretty much flat with this other fear gauge that we follow. And we did show some improvement. The, over the weekend, I was pointing this out that we had a solid update on Friday, but we're seeing the advanced decline line as well as some other indicators that we have actually going down. Well, we saw them turn back up in Monday session. So that's looking a little more positive there. And we're seeing... New highs doing okay right now. We're seeing an, an expansion and we're not really seeing any new lows. So that's turned our five period and our 10 period back to going higher. We're still positive here with the advanced decline ratio. We're above zero and accumulation distribution is above the moving average now. So that's turning more positive. The Jake and money flow is still negative, but it is continuing to advance and could cross positive possibly 
if we see more follow through upside movement or positive with the chicken oscillator we saw an okay reading here with the regular advanced decline line we're starting to break above the 50 period moving average a bit and the cumulative here in the middle area that was up in monday session and we're showing some improvement with our other nyse advanced decline line we're still looking better with common stock with the advanced decline line based on price. And we're seeing this going up with a little more velocity based on volume. As I've been pointing out, that could end up being positive for the market. But a month, a month and a half ago or so, I was seeing the same thing and it really didn't lead to anything. We're looking more positive here with our NYSE new highs minus the new lows. We're still coming in above zero. So that's looking more positive. And our advanced decline line for the S&P for the price showing an improvement also going back up based on volume. Looking a little better with our advanced decline line studies for the NYSE common stock, the S&P mid caps, small caps are still under their moving average even though they were up on Monday. Our short term chart, we still have some overhead resistance. We have pivot points, we have moving averages above current price. If we fall, we do have this other S1 level pivot point down here. And we did drop to below average with volume. We're getting extreme positive with the Stoke RSI. Just something we want to be aware of. If we continue to be positive, we can camp up here for long periods of time. And we're battling a little bit here with our 20 period moving averages. We're coming right up to the 20 period simple moving average. That's the red line. We haven't really closed above that yet. We're looking a little better with our double and triple exponential moving average based on 20 periods. We're above both of the both of the lines and the lines are starting to turn back up. This is still negative though. We're coming up into this mini rainbow that is acting as overhead resistance and it will continue to do so until we can clear this mini rainbow and close on that basis. We're turning back up with our 20, 50, and 200 period moving averages. That was a little bit of a concern after Friday's session. Looking a little more positive with the force index. And we're looking better here with the short-term stochastics. We're also turning back positive with the intermediate-term stochastics. And we're still negative, but we're showing some improvement with our long-term stochastics chart. We're getting just a little bit above the midpoint here with our standard deviations chart. So that could be turning more positive as well. Intermediate term, the balance of power is going up, but still negative. The go no go still has the lighter shade of purple. And we're coming up above the midpoint here with our highest high, lowest low value. So that's showing some improvement for the time being. The TTM squeeze is negative, but starting to come back up. So showing some improvement there. We're still at the underside of our triple period exponential moving average based on, or triple exponential moving average based on 50 periods. That is now acting as overhead resistance. And we're also battling with the 50-day simple moving average. We've not been able to break above that, at least yet. The 100-period moving average, we just want to keep an eye on this in case we start to see some weakness. So far, that is held as support. We're looking better here with the ease of movement, but we're still negative. We're flat with the Arun indicator. We're crossing back above zero with the S&P McClellan oscillator. So that's turning positive. It was a bit of a concern that that dropped to negative after Friday. We're flat pretty much with the summation index, but we're starting to show more of an improvement here based on volume. That could be positive. And we're turning back and looking more positive with the NYSE McClellan oscillator. We're above zero. So we're just barely starting to turn up based on price and looking a little bit more convicted here based on volume going higher. The swell and trading oscillator, this is still a little bit of a concern. We were showing some real strength here. We turned down a little bit after Friday. We're still continuing to decline after Monday and we've had two up days. So we just want to be aware of that, but it's still positive for right now. Our momentum oscillators are showing improvements pretty much across the board, but we're still negative. We're starting to turn up with the PMO just starting to cross the moving average based on price and coming up to the moving average based on volume. So we're looking better here with the PMOs that are rising. The buy signals are showing an improvement and we're slowly starting to turn up with the PMOs above zero. We continue to be positive with the elders impulse system and we're positive with the parabolic SAR. Here's our slope oscillator, our touchiest oscillator. It's starting to turn back up and crossing above the moving average, but it's still negative. 
The MACD is also trying to turn up and getting close to crossing its moving average, but it's still below zero. So all of our oscillators are showing some improvement, not so much in the long term. They need a little bit longer to actually roll over and look more positive if we end up going in that direction. But we're looking much better in the short term, a lot of improvement in the intermediate term. And we're just dealing with the spaghetti here as we try to break out of these moving averages if the market is able to do that. We're looking a little better here with the bullish percent index. We're above 50 and continuing to go up. So that's positive there. We're also ticking up just a little bit with the NYSE bullish percent index. We're still negative with the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index, but showing some real improvement. We're still negative with the money flow, but we did go up. We're turning positive with the ultimate oscillator. The vortex is still negative with the red line on top, but it's flattening out and has been declining recently. The RSI, we're just starting to come back above the midpoint here with the RSI based on 14 periods. We've already crossed above the midpoint with our shorter term RSI based on nine periods. We're coming back up to the moving average with on balance volume. And we're still negative here with our, the stocks inside the S&P above their 20-day moving averages, but we are showing some improvement here. We're coming right up to the midpoint with the stocks above their 50-period moving average. We're turning back up with the 100 and going back up with the 200. This was also producing some mixed signals over the weekend that now seems to be improving, at least to right now. The copy curve, not quite positive yet, but trying to cross above the moving average. The Sean trend meter is pretty much flat. And we're still thinking that this Ichimoku cloud was part of the reason that we found some support as we were going down. So far, we've been bouncing up off of that. Here's one that I haven't shown in a while. This is the Pring bottom fisher. And this tries to pick when we're at a bottom in the market. Now, sometimes when you pick a bottom, you end up with stinky fingers, okay? Other times, it, you end up looking like a genius. This would be a signal. We got kind of a deep reading here, but we need to use other things as well and ultimately follow price and what it's doing. But this is starting to generate a signal right now. And other times when we've seen that, sometimes it was just a short-term blip. Other times, we this was not really considered a strong signal, but then look at what the market did after that. This was a pretty good signal back almost last May in 2023. We saw a nice little upward move after that. So we just use this in conjunction with other indicators. And this is now looking a little more positive. We're turning back and looking more positive with the Hike and Ashi chart. We're turning up with the Kigi chart, black and pointing up. That's positive. The Renko chart's looking more positive and the three line break is looking positive. And we're now just a little bit above this R1 level. This is the weekly chart of the S&P, and these are the pivot points. We're just barely above that for right now. But it's not really going to count until the end of the week, whether we're above it or below it. We're still looking pretty extreme here with our 150 and 200 period moving averages. But you could say that in a positive way, that it just shows that the long term continues to hold up. We're positive across the board according to the Keller market model. We're still negative across the board with bonds based on price. No change with the decision point scorecard. And we saw some positive and a couple of negative things here. The NASDAQ closed down a little bit near the end of the day. But we're seeing how the S&P got back above 5,100. I mean, it was at 5,100 for all intents and purposes after Friday. It was, what, four hundredths of a point away. So we're seeing some improvement here and the equal weight is holding up for right now the red line compared to the s p 500 we came down just a little bit some of the mega caps got hit a little bit in monday's session so this ratio declined slightly we're looking okay here with the dow but we're still below the 50-day moving average we're still below this pivot point but we've turned over to positive with the elders impulse system for the diamonds. And we have some, and I know it's hard to see it. We've got overhead resistance and a 50 day moving average here with the NASDAQ. Also overhead resistance and a little further to go with the 50 day moving average for the NASDAQ 100. We're still remaining positive with the QQQs with the elders impulse system. The momentum for the NASDAQ 100 is still negative, but we're starting to cross above the moving average. That could turn it more positive. And then we would see confirmation of that if we come back and cross above zero. We're still showing the 2050 crossover negative here, but the Qs are also battling with their 20 and possibly 50 day moving averages. 
as overhead resistance. The small caps continue to be more or less range bound and they're not really going anywhere. They're also battling their 50 day moving average. And they continue to be positive with the elders impulse system for the small caps. We're still above this resistance slash support line here with the Russell 2000 small cap index. We're crossing above 50 with the RSI. The momentum is looking a little more positive and longer term, we still are in an uptrend, but they've been just chopping around treadmill like. The mid caps are also coming up to their 50 day moving average and also have a pivot point above current price. This could be providing overhead resistance. We are positive with the elders impulse system for the mid caps. And then looking at some of the magnificent seven stocks, we have Apple, which was up, but just starting to come above its 50 day moving average but it's still in a downtrend. Tesla, which is in a downtrend, continues to shoot for the moon after having a not very good earnings report last week. NVIDIA is coming back and getting above its 50-day moving average, so that's showing more improvement. Microsoft is still underneath its 50-day moving average. It was down 1%. Meta, which came out with a pretty good report, but they didn't like what they said. It's just been getting hammered lately. It's well down below its 50-day moving average. Amazon is coming back up and trying to break above its 50-day moving average. And Google, after setting an all-time high when they came out with their earnings report, it's been pretty much declining ever since then. And then the FANG index, it actually closed above its 50-day moving average. So this could be somewhat positive. It's one of the few main indexes that we look at that's actually above its 50-day moving average. The financial sector is right back down to its 50-day moving average. We're still declining here when we look at staples to tech and take a ratio. When this is declining, that means staples are underperforming or tech is outperforming. To be more positive, we want this ratio to come back down. And so far, after hitting this 200-day moving average, it has been declining. The dollar, it was actually down in Monday's session, but it's been up in the after-hour session. And when we look at stocks and compare it with the rest of the world, we're coming down just a little bit with our short-term correlation. We're flat to slightly declining with our longer-term correlation. And we're still battling with the 50-day moving average with the total U.S. stock ETF. We did come down with the 10-year yield. We were up with the 10-year based on price. And then going through growth to value, we are seeing a bit of an improvement here with Qs to the S&P. We're still coming up to the moving average. We actually saw a little bit of a breakout here with discretionary to the S&P. Large cap growth versus large cap value is coming back up to the moving average. So we're seeing a slight improvement here with the large caps turning up, but still below the moving average with the mid caps and also below the moving average with the small caps. We're still above zero and starting to show an improvement with our 10 day average of the S&P 500 highs minus the lows. We're still showing an improvement here with our 19 day exponential moving average of the advanced decline ratio. We climbed back above zero based on price and volume. So this is also improving. And we're slightly negative here, but showing improvement when we look across the broad market at a five period moving average of the highs minus the lows. We're ticking back up just a little bit with our S&P to utilities ratio, but overall this has been declining. We want to see this turn and go back up for it to be more positive. And we're declining just a little bit here with our staples to S&P ratio. We want to see this decline if we're going to actually turn more positive. And we're still waiting and it looked like the, uh, now remember there's a one day lag with this whole thing. This is after Friday. We just got this little blip up here, really not much. We have until this Friday to generate a Zwag NYSE breadth for us. Because according to what I could see, this was April 15th when we had this really extreme negative reading. We have 10 trading days, which would be the five that we just finished last week. Now we have four left as of right now to see if we can get above this red line. Other times when we saw this type of a signal, you can see what the S&P did after that. So this could be really positive if that's what ends up happening. But we don't know yet. So what's our outlook for Tuesday? We're still negative in the short and intermediate term, but we're looking more positive. But we're dealing with this overhead resistance. We're going to get the Employment Cost Index and the FHFA Housing Price Index, the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index, so a lot of housing data, the Chicago PMI, Consumer Confidence. And then we want to keep an eye on all the crazy things going on in the world in case they have an impact on the markets. Here's the economic calendar. 
On Wednesday, we're going to get the ISM manufacturing, a very major report. That's also the when the Fed's going to come out and make their announcement and have their press conference. And then on Friday, we're going to get the employment situation report and then the non-manufacturing PMI. So this is a pretty hefty week. And we'll see how things look for Tuesday here with the Chicago PMI and consumer confidence being what this calendar thinks is the most important. Seasonality, we are negative when it comes to the last trading day of April across and quite negative at that. So be aware of that. And then we'll be on the last trading day of the month. We're also seeing negativity seasonally wise when we look at this during an election year. And then we're trying to figure out where we're at with this whole thing, where we do tend to see some weakness into May that could carry over into June. Here's another chart also showing some weakness throughout May, even during an election year, even when we compare it to the top first quarter, even though we were blowing this out of the water earlier on, this still could put some pressure on the markets for May. And as I've been saying, it, it's not necessarily a real negative month. It, it sometimes actually has a good winning track record, but the return is not all that good. Tuesday is one of the more negative days. It's virtually unchanged, but Typically, it ends up being more of a negative day followed by Wednesday. So that's at least how things played out in 2023. And we do see a little positive blip up here on the last trading day when looking at this chart. And then we're still in that positive time, according to Tom Bally's research. And then we're starting to get ready for May here. This is the calendar day in and day out that I'll start to include in tomorrow's video where, well, see a little bit of positive uptick to start the month, and then we see some more weakness before we see a bounce, and then some more weakness. If we do see any more strength, it could potentially come later on in the month of May. This also shows, looking into May, where it's really choppy. Here it says we chop into Memorial Day, and then we sometimes have a summer rally, and maybe that's what the market is anticipating. May does end up being strong, especially, excuse me, weak, especially the first half of the month. And then during an election year, though, according to what Carson found, we're up 77.8% of the time with a 2.3% return, depending on how you crunch the numbers. So for May, we don't have a good return, but we do have a pretty good track record here. And then looking, here's May, which is not all that great in and of itself. But now we're starting to look out a little further, where during an election year, sometimes this can end up being positive for June, July, and August. So what are our warning signs here? The NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index is still negative, but it is bouncing. The chicken money flow is negative, but it's also bouncing. The money flow is negative. The Copic curve continues to be negative. The vortex is negative. Our oscillators are negative, but improving. We're still below short and intermediate term. We're not below long-term support, but that's not official until we finish out the weekly calendar. The momentum for the NASDAQ 100 is improving, but it's still negative. Positive signs. We're positive with the McClellan oscillator for the S&P as well as the NYSE. The Swindland Trading Oscillator is positive, but it's rolling over a little bit. So that's causing a bit of a concern. The Parabolic SAR is positive. We're above 50 with the bullish percent index for the S&P. The Chaikin Oscillator is positive, as is the Ultimate Oscillator. And the long-term trend still remains positive. The Equity Put Call Ratio now continues to go down. The financial sector is still positive. It's hanging out around its 50-day moving average like everything else. And then we have another NSE breadth thrust. I never did go in and change this. We don't know if that's going to be a signal or not. We just have to wait to see if that will actually play out that way. Then our conclusion. So we're negative in the short and intermediate term, but possibly turning positive. We do have overhead resistance. We are improving in the short term, but we have resistance overhead. We're negative and we're still below support, but we are bouncing in the intermediate term where we continue to be positive in the long term. Thank you. I hope you have a really good day and I will talk to you in the next video.